We've already. I know we've already. We already, already shit all over up, that. So yeah. So <laughs> let's let's figure. You got, you got. We got something to work with. Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar. A place where pop culture creatives discover design icons that make us tick. And we share a few cocktails in the process. Yep. Todd, as we discussed, there was so much good material we shared for our movie logos that we just ran out of time. Yeah, right about the time listeners were running out of patience. So it worked out. But hey, we're back. You, the listeners, are back. So let's tie up our movie logos with a bow. And move on to just a little more of some Hollywood stories. When two designers walk back into a bar. We talked movie logos. We talked Ghostbusters. We talked Rocketeer. In fact, we talked so much that we ran out of time last time. And we had to do this little extra, which, uh, you know... Probably good for us, probably good for the listener because it gives us a little more room to uh, pontificate, or it gives our listeners one more chance to fast forward through this stuff. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to want to fast forward through this stuff. Yeah, hopefully not. Um, so I thought a great place to start, picking up where we uh, last left off, was uh, let's talk Ghostbusters, let's talk the logo, and let's talk about the ways that it worked and the reasons that it worked. And then we yeah. can chat Rocketeer, and then we'll jump into your juicy Hollywood story. How does that sound? Rock on, man. All right, cool. So three things, I think, about the Ghostbusters logo that made it great, just to summarize. So first, it was based on an international symbol, the no sign, right? The circle with a slash through it. That's something everybody understands the world over. So there wasn't any kind of language barrier there. It was just a great instantly recognizable icon. The second thing that I feel makes it great, as we discussed, it was used appropriately in the movie. It was used on clothing, on vehicles, and signage and so forth. And that really adds to the believability of it. It was the logo for the movie, but it was also the logo for the business in the movie. And that's just wonderful to me. And the third thing is the luck of timing. When we talk about pop culture, I think so many of these things always boils down to creativity. But another reason is good timing, right time, right place. This movie came out in the mid 80s when people were very logo conscious. Think about coca-cola clothing you remember that in the mid 80s all these oh sorts of things oh my gosh yes right right so logo consciousness designer labels nike was really starting to take off and become big in a very brand conscious sort of way so it easily plugged into the logo culture during that time and uh, there's sort of a nod to this if you go back and you watch the ghostbusters movie as they start to become popular and as they start to become famous, do you remember the media montage in the movie where they're on Larry King, they're on the front page of USA Today, right, and all these right. different sorts of things, they're plugging products and all this stuff. So there was a total send-up of pop culture, even within the movie, that made it great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love, love, love Ghostbusters, as we've talked about, and you, of course, love The Rocketeer. So I would enjoy hearing, just top line for us, what are the three things you feel make the Rocketeer logo so successful? Sure. Well, there's a couple. Uh, there's actually some similarities as I'm thinking about it. The one thing is um, it it is sort of it's about Hollywood. It's a Hollywood movie about Hollywood, which, you know, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But the first thing that I think we have to mention is, as you and I said, this movie, The Rocketeer, which came out in the uh, early 90s, has developed a huge cult following, but it really performed poorly at the box office. But it's a beautiful movie. It is definitely of the time. They went through great uh, lengths to make it look like 
Uh, it was the 1930s in Hollywood. So that's two things. And the last thing is something that I think ties both of these movies together is uh, they sort of are scenes within scenes. Um, with the Ghostbusters, as you said, it's obviously it's a business. They're wearing the logo. Uh, things are happening, um, as you just said, with the media montage that puts it sort of like, is this real? Is this not real? Uh, and with the Rocketeer, that same thought is kind of tied up in these deep Hollywood tropes. Um, definitely of the 1930s. Disney did a great job with this, making it look and feel and sound like the 1930s. There's this dashing leading man, as you would expect, who is the hero, who, who is the rocketeer, Cliff Secord. Uh, then there is the cad, played by Timothy Dalton, who, as you mentioned, was also playing James Bond at the time. There were Nazis, because you've got to have universal bad guys in any kind of Hollywood story. And then it ties into some Hollywood lore. Like uh, you had mentioned, Howard Hughes uh, is in this, not the real Howard Hughes, as we said. And then there are some cool things that happen involving uh, Hollywood itself. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more now. That's awesome. Let's jump in. I'm curious. But I've got a tiny trivia question for you because I know you love the trivia. I do. Um, all right. Do you remember Harold Ramis's character's name? In Ghostbusters? Yeah. Egon Spengler. Okay. Do you know where the name comes from? I forget. Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, remember when his character Egon meets, um, oh God, what's the, um, the, the assistant's name, the lady? Janine. Um, Janine yeah. Melnitz. Yeah, she's under the he's under the desk, you yes. know, and hooking up, and she, she's like, "Oh, I play racquetball, and you know, I read a lot, blah blah blah." And, and he's and then he comes up and he says, "Print is dead." Yes. Okay, so here is a little bit of meta fun for you. So Egon Spangler, the name Egon was an exchange student, best friend of his in high school, a <laughs> Hungarian exchange student. <laughs> Spangler comes from Oswald Spangler who was a futurist at the turn of last century in early 1900s. And he predicted, he did a lot of sort of media predictions. And he said that this media, blank media, would be the cause of Western decline. So what media do you think he was talking about? Mm. Social media. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, he'd be a damn good People futurist saw, if he yeah. figured that yeah. out. I mean, geez, I would say, <laughs> you know, probably something like movies. Well, Telegraph, actually. Oh. Um, <laughs> this, we're talking like 1910 here. The Telegraph was going to be the downfall oh. of Western civilization. Oh. So anyway, if he were alive now, boy, howdy. Um, <laughs> he would realize that Western civilization still chugging along and really... I would argue Western civilization contributed to the downfall of the telegraph. <laughs> that would be, uh, now that actually is a twist on the meta, isn't it? Okay. Speaking of meta, back to the Rocketeer for a second. So at the end of the movie, again, not giving a whole lot away, but one person flies into the uh, Hollywood land sign. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean Hollywood land? Okay. So we're, everybody in, in the whole world is familiar with the Hollywood sign that sits on Mount Lee in the Hollywood Hills. It was first created in 1923 as a very temporary sign to advertise some bougie housing development called Hollywood Land. So just like the Hollywood sign, but L-A-N-D on the back end of it. So here's the funny thing is, I started researching because that sounded like a classic trope, right? The Hollywood sign and even the destruction of it. So I started, there are sites dedicated to the Hollywood sign. So this is what's funny is they fall into three kind of basic categories. By far, 75% of the movies that you see the Hollywood sign in, it's an early part of the movie or it's scene setting in some way. So 
that idea of setting the scene with the Hollywood sign was actually first used in 1935 in Sunset Boulevard. Right, because the the protagonist character was this woman who was sort of a washed up Hollywood. Norma Desmond. Yes. 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 Okay, so that's by far how the world knows of the U.S. is through the Hollywood sign to set scenes, and it's been used in about a bazillion movies. The second way, which is a little bit more esoteric, is it kills people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It this, falls this, on This them. begs further explanation. <laughs> yeah, okay. Or, or, you know, it's some kind of, like, secret portal to another layer, like an Austin Powers gold member. <laughs> um, it, it's took place. And okay. It's, <laughs> all right. But a third way, which is also used quite a lot, like it was in Rocketeer, is uh, the Hollywood sign gets destroyed in some way. Okay. Uh, this, this first started in the movie Earthquake in 1974. I'm sure as a one-year-old, it was probably one of your favorites. I loved um, it. I would watch it every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and you, you talked about John Belushi. See, we're going to tie so many things together with this trope here. Oh, man. In uh, his movie, 1941, um, he crashes into the Hollywood land sign and uh, blows up the land. And and for um, those of you keeping score, that was one of Steven Spielberg's biggest bomb movies. Yes. Yes, it was. And again, great movie. Um, so used tons of movies, Independence Day, The Day After Tomorrow, um, a movie called Ten Point Five, with, which is about a John, or excuse me, that's a that's a TV movie called Ten Point Five, and all of these kind of represent civilization falling, right? It's the, the this classic Hollywood movie sign, which was really only supposed to be up for eighteen months to sell some housing um, plots, has uh, been up for uh, almost a hundred years, so. That trope of seeing things kind of crumble, seeing the Hollywood uh, sign fall apart is something um, that has been used over and over and over again. And one of the most recent examples, um, well, it's kind of been a it's a it's a franchise, but it was first used in the movie Sharknado in (laughs) 2013. This tornado (laughs) blows the letters away. Right. And what here's what's so great. One of the letters that gets blown away crushes an aspiring actor in Hollywood just after he says, my mom always told me Hollywood would kill me. (laughs) (laughs) I I love that. I love that. That's great. Man. And and you know what? That did not win an Oscar. Wait, hold on. What? Yeah. It was then, right then, that I knew the Oscars were rigged. You know what? When Sharknado didn't win You know what? For me, uh, I'll freely admit it was when Snakes on a Plane didn't win anything. Oh, man. The fix was in after that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's rigged. Uh, Anyway, that trope goes on and on and on and on. Um, But those are sort of the three uses of the Hollywood sign. And uh, let me wrap up talking about the Rocketeer for a half a second here and tell you that there's been talk of a sequel out in the giant webosphere forever and ever. And as a matter of fact, in um, February of 2020, which was really, you know, uh, almost a year ago now, it was reported, it was confirmed by Disney um, that there's a sequel in the works. There's a draft in the works uh, that would probably be going to the streaming service. Mm. And it's directed by a guy named J.D. Dillard, and it will be called The Rocketeers with the plural there. Interesting. So yeah. is any of the original cast slated to come back? Well, it's a little kludgy on that. Mm. Um, the talk around the web is that the uh, the main character, the Rocketeer character, uh, Cliff Secord, will come back. But the plot is, is that he's gone missing while fighting the Nazis. Ah. So this movie takes place six years after the initial movie so yeah i think it's going to be a little bit of like skywalker magic there where he'll probably show up at the end but it'll be the MacGuffin, you know that pushes the movie forward looking for cliff the original rocketeer but here's the cool thing it will star um a young african-american woman as the lead so she becomes the new uh rocketeer which is 
really cool when you think about it's taking place in 1944 then. Is Alan Arkin going to take her under his wing? <laughs> I, I, I cannot uh, confirm or deny that from the webosphere. I see. I see. Well, that's exciting. So, Todd, you talked about the Hollywood sign and really how um, L.A. and Southern California is kind of a major character in The Rocketeer. Yeah. I feel that New York is really a character in Ghostbusters. I really think that I'm sure for Dan Aykroyd, after living there, working on Saturday Night Live and all these other things, I'm sure he fell in love with the city. And I think he, at that point, of course, had already done the Blues Brothers. And uh, I consider the Blues Brothers a love letter to Chicago. So Absolutely. in that yeah. sense, I think it, it only is fitting that he would also sort of make a love letter to New York. And to me, when you think about the locations, the fire station at Tribeca Fire Station, right, you think right. about the New York Public Library, of course, and the opening setup. And right. uh, you think about the apartment building at Central Park West and Tavern on the Green across the mm -hmm. street where mm -hmm. Lewis mm -hmm. Tully is banging on the windows to no avail while the swells watch him get eaten by a demonic hound. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, Columbia, the mystery college that they got mm -hmm. uh, kicked mm -hmm. out of was... Uh, Turns out it was Columbia University. And from what I remember, Columbia basically said, we'll let you film here, but we don't want you to say in any way, shape or form it's us. <laughs> oh, and I think it was funny. in case the movie was a bomb. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. So as a result of that, my son and I, I have a, a son in his early teens and he grew up watching Ghostbusters. I, would, I introduced him to some of my favorite movies when he was pretty young and uh when we were up in New York, we've taken some guys' trips to New York together and things like that. He and I have been to Dana Barrett's apartment building near Columbus Circle. We've been to Columbia's campus. We've been to the reading room at the New York Public Library. We haven't made mm -hmm. it to the fire station yet, but it was really fun when we got up to Columbia. We were walking around, and I said, you know, this is a pretty nice college campus, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it is. And I said, look around, what movie was shot here? And he looks around, and two seconds later, he's like, oh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, even, you know, amazing. as tactfully as Columbia tried to collect some Hollywood money and not make their uh, campus known, uh, I think everyone basically figured it out pretty quickly. So, uh, and, and of course, the scene you had brought up, our friend Stay Puffed, and uh, right. the church right next to the apartment building, which is a real church, which is still right. there today, when Stay Puffed steps on it and uh, Pete Venkman says, no one steps on a church in my town. You know, I just love that. Uh, my other, so it's the my other... same principle. It's like, it's iconic uh, city representing sort of things going wrong. And, uh, you know, the church, the real church is getting stepped on. Other buildings are getting crushed <laughs> that people are familiar with in the city. The other, one of my other, in that same scene, one of my favorite lines in the movie that also <laughs> mentions the city is uh, when they're sort of hunkered under that stone bench on the roof and Stay Puft is climbing up, coming after them, and they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out what to do. And uh, Pete Venkman says, hey, this Mr. Stay Puft, he's not such a bad guy. He's a sailor. He's in New York. We get this guy laid. We won't have anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that line. Oh, man, classic. So I've got to go back and watch ghostbusters um it's been a while since i've seen it and um this talk of the rocketeer has made me want to go back and watch that again yes, see how it too. has held up um i think both would be great for uh, a movie night one night don't you i do if it may be todd we have to we'll have to join our our bar bubble together and then you and i can just hang out in quarantine for two weeks and just watch our favorite movies Todd, thanks for this trip down memory lane. I enjoyed revisiting fun movies, quotes, mm -hmm. logos, mm -hmm. posters, signs. I mean, we really covered it all, I think. Destruction of major cities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> things were stepped on. Things were knocked down. Things were blown up. I mean, you mm. really, you can't ask for a more action-packed episode as a listener. That's right. That's right. Wow, hey, is this like us buying a free round for everyone in the bar? Ha! How would you know what that's like? You've never bought me a beer. 
Hmm. In that case, I'm returning all those vintage Pez dispensers I haven't bought for you yet. Damn. All right, let's talk again soon. All right, back to the bar, man. While we have your attention, if you want to learn more about us and the podcast, there are a few ways to do it. Visit our website at two designerswalkintoabar.com. All of that is spelled out. No numbers. Kind of a long URL, so do yourself a favor and bookmark it. Once you're there, you can find links to more information about the subjects in this episode, our episode archive, and information about both of us. Wait. We do want people to visit, right? Oh, and look for us on social media. You can find those links on our website as well. And while we're at it, if you have a friend who you feel will dig on our rambling... Tell him or her what we're up to. While we can't guarantee that they will remain your friend, we can guarantee that they will listen to at least 30 seconds of whatever episode you send them the link to. That's being a little shameless. And speaking of being shameless, it wouldn't be a proper ask if we didn't mention that if you like what you hear, you can also make a donation via our website. We have a Nigerian prince handling all transactions for us. In fact, he told us to mention that we have stickers to mail to anyone who donates $10 or more. Are we done? We're done. We're done.